another episode of the Lore Entertainment Podcast. I'm Andrew Southwick, this time joined with, uh, by, excuse me, I'm not joined with, we're not Siamese twins, uh, joined by Nathaniel Talbot, one of the executives and, and founders at Lore. Also, he loves to go fly fishing in the winter, not sure why, but maybe he'll tell us about that. Nathaniel, thanks for being on the Lore Entertainment Podcast today. Thanks for having me, man. This is really exciting. I'm uh, I'm really psyched to be able to get involved with this uh, early on. Um, who knows? Could be the most loved guest. Could be the most hated guest. We don't know yet. Well, as long as you're one or the other, I, then then we're good to go. It's right. like it's like pro wrestling, right? It doesn't matter if they cheer or boo, as long as they do. Just one of those things. Yes. Indifference we don't want, but love it or hate it, that's what we want here. So if we can be the most hated show, I'd love to be the most hated podcast in America. That'd be fantastic. Uh, that would be it, awesome. <laughs> anyway, uh, quickly, what's coming up on the show? Of course, we're going to do our opening uh, Hollywood Watch. You cover a little, about a, a little bit of Hollywood news, what's going on um, in the headlines. We've got some a couple of good stories there. Our lore creator guest today, our lore creator spotlight is Joel Burris, filmmaker, director, writer, Joel Burris. He'll be talking about his latest project, uh, how that came to be. A lot of good stuff in that segment. Yeah. It seems like Hollywood, instead of being snow blind, is woke blind, woke has become an industry. You see uh, artists and athletes of all kinds, um, uh, politicians, corporations. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, even regular institutions, schools, hospitals. We've seen this over the past few years, and it seems to have no end in sight. Well, interesting. Fox, uh, Fox News put out an article uh, this week Featuring actor Sharon Stone. Some of you might remember Sharon Stone. She was really big in the 90s. Probably her two most famous uh, uh, roles were Basic Instinct with Michael Douglas. And then, of course, Casino with uh, Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci II in, in Scorsese's uh, Mafia trilogy, so to speak. And uh, so she's really big in the 90s. Not as big lately, but uh, if you were a film fan back then, you would know who she is. Well, a few years ago, uh, maybe almost a decade ago, she did have a stroke. And that's a serious thing. And so she she spoke out about how she feels that Hollywood has forgotten her, that Hollywood has left her behind because not only is she older than she was in the 90s, but also she had a stroke. And so her her physical abilities are, are, are different, uh, they're limited or what have you. It's different capacity. She's not who she was. And in the same article, though, and in the same article, though, she went on to talk about how we need to, to mandate more diversity. And we know diversity is another code for wokeness. And the question is this, because on the one hand, Sharon Stone is decrying the very wokeness, the very kinds of um, uh, decision making and so on and so forth uh, about her not getting roles because she's older, not getting roles because uh, she had the stroke and has complications from that, not getting roles because whatever, she was in the 90s or all these different, you know, vapid, uh, um, what am I looking for, shallow reasons that, that we know Hollywood is full of. But at the same time, uh, she's promoting those same values because wokeness is just as, just as shallow um, and certainly just as skin deep as the, the uh, values values that she is speaking out against or the lack of values that she's speaking out against. And I wonder, Nathaniel, if you can shed some light as to why woke blindness is such a, well, uh, for lack of a better term, such a viral disease, so to speak, uh, in and throughout Hollywood and why wokeness has become such a cottage industry to the point where the people in the industry themselves complain about it while at the same time continuing to promote it. Yeah, I mean, where do we start? The, I mean, the fundamental thing that you have to understand about these these narratives and these stories is that um, <laughs> this is a narrative that's being used to say, "I want mine." So it's a it's a narrative of envy. Um, uh, the fancy word for it is resentment. Um, that's a, a fancy your fancy philosophical term for today. Um, but it basically says, um, I want to get mine. So that article was so sad to read. Um, I'm, I mean, I hate to say it, but I wonder some if, I mean, the, the stroke was two decades ago, but when you read the incoherence of what, uh, Sharon Stone had to say in that speech that she had and the contradictions just running throughout the whole, the whole, uh, talk, 
it was, yeah. yeah. maybe she's still suffering a little bit from that stroke. I'm not sure. Like that was, that was pretty brutal. Um, and, uh, like she, on the one hand, she says, you know, I, she's saying, I can't get the roles that I want anymore. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to work with me. Um, and we we need more diversity. But on the other hand, like there's no coherence there as to like for her, like wokeness basically includes anything that gets her more jobs. Like, yeah, yeah. We, she, she went on to expand. She said diversity doesn't just mean, you know, skin color, whatever she means. You know, diversity is you know, stroke symptoms and, and you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but but she expanded diversity to mean everything. And that is one other hallmark of wokeness. It is incoherent because the definitions only last so far as they help you in the moment right now, get what you want subjectively at any given time. And that can literally change from moment to moment. Right, it really helps to understand it as a power play. Um, the, the goal is to basically expand the um, basically find as many intersection, uh, intersections of other people oppressing you as you can. That increases your victimhood, and that then gives you more power to basically tell people to do what you want, uh, to tell more power to make people do what you want them to do. So it's just, um, it's flabbergasting. I think, you know, the key thing always to keep in mind, though, right, is going back to Romans 1, and hmm. recognizing the fact that men suppress the truth and unrighteousness, right? So we look at this and it looks like a really complicated setup and there's all these philosophical in, uh, underpinnings. You've got the, you know, the Frankfurt School and Marxist revolution, the Marxist revolutionary spirit and all this stuff. And it seems really complicated. But at the end of the day, what you have is sinful human beings um, who are in rebellion against God. And um, Sharon Stone is absolutely right. Um that Hollywood um, does not see the image of God in man and exalt that, right? Mm -hmm. They're after these cheap tricks. They're after all they care about is youth and beauty. Um, and there's much more uh, to that. But also, at the same time, she is the one who uh, has fed into and continues to prop up this industry that isn't actually focused on the good, tr the true, and the beautiful, um, it's focused on, you know, the cheap, the chintzy, uh, it's focused on undermining things like the, the lifetime value of a woman, the, the, the changing nature of her, um, virtue over time. Absolutely. Um, much of what we value in young women is their beauty, but not just external beauty, although that's actually important. Aesthetics are important, but also their internal beauty. But then we know that that matures through motherhood and other things into a full flowered, uh, beauty as a woman ages. And it's, um, and, and then you've got, I mean, Sharon Stone should be a grandmother, like, uh, you know, with a bunch of grandkids in her house that she should be, uh, counseling. And yet she has bought into and continues to prop up an industry that takes women and says, no, they're really only good for one thing. When they're young, we just, we just exploit them as best we can. Yeah. You know, so here's another example of this. And um, I did not prep you on this. So Nathaniel, you, this will, you're going to get this um, uh, cold. But there are a couple of there are a couple articles that just came out uh, covering Ellen Page, who now goes by Elliot Page. And some of you will remember her from uh, X-Men movies and Juno. And what else is she in? Uh, um, at, at any rate, uh, Juno is probably her most popular movie. That was a good show. That was a good movie. But yeah. um uh, anyway, she came out and said, oh, in Inception, and that's why, that's why I'm thinking about this. So she said that she suffered, uh, the first headline was she got shingles from being in Inception because she was stressed out from being around so many cisgendered, apparently that's a thing, uh, other, in other words, a biological men, which shouldn't surprise her at the time because she's a biological female, and if there's a cast as mostly men, she's going to be around them. Anyway, this stressed her out. Then a second art article came out that talked about how she grew up in a, you know, her home was sheltered and homosexuality didn't exist. Now, if you read those two articles, again, this is the incoherence. And, and I say this carefully, I'm not trying to be facetious and I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to make fun of, of, of her or, or what she's going through, because I will say this, the, especially with the transgender movement and how it is, 
got gotten a party to this wokeism and, and woke blindness, so to speak. Um, you know, how much do you have to hate yourself to want to literally change and carve up your body to be the furthest thing from yourself that you can think of? Well, in that, she talks about how she knew she was gay and she secretly had a girlfriend while she was on the set, so on and so forth, that she fell in love with a girl who was a lesbian or is a lesbian or whatever. But then she, though, said that she has always felt like she's been a man. So then she had surgeries and hormones to try to turn into a man. If she is a man and she is with a woman, then she is not a homosexual she would be heterosexual. And if the woman she's with is a lesbian and continues to be with her after she is a man and knowing that she's a man, not that she can become a man, but again, I'm trying to work within the, the realm of reality that they're, <laughs> that they're setting up an offering. I'm trying to understand this because you're telling me you're a woman who's not a woman. You're also telling me you're homosexual. You're also telling me that homosexuality didn't exist in your home when you knew it did. But if you are a homosexual, how can you turn into the other thing. I mean, it just, it's just, it, it, it's, it's so confusing and twisting around. And just by me asking that question, I know that's considered hate speech because I'm not buying into the premises that gender doesn't exist and all this other stuff, um, which if you know the history of that with John Money, it's completely fraudulent. But nonetheless, uh, this is a part of that woke blindness where they don't see how their own even their own worldviews cannot possibly reconcile. And if they're going to create an industry on this, they're going to find themselves boxed out at one time or another, just like Sharon Stone. Right, right. I mean, I we've dead, made, dead named Ellen Page now, and we've misgendered Ellen Page. Um, and the sad thing is that that is more loving than what anyone around her is actually saying uh, to her. Right. Hmm. Um, the the again, I go back to the here's someone who's obviously like seriously hurting um, and sees that the best way to get sympathy uh, in the short term. Um, it's like a short term investment strategy. Right. I'm going to invest into victimhood. But long term, nobody wants to hang out with victims. Nobody wants to have victims on their shows. Uh, that becomes a huge liability for productions and other things when you know that this person might just like flip out at some point on you or accuse you of things. And so uh, it, it's like right now, sure, you, you might score some diversity points for having uh, uh, Ellen Page um, on your in your production as a quote unquote man. But really long term, like, I mean, Sharon Stone, at least like she's having trouble uh, getting uh, work. And that's from a natural like a 20, a two decade old stroke. And you've got uh, and now you've got um, I mean, what does what does Ellen Page think is going to happen in 20 years? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's just super sad. And um, I mean, the. The, the challenge for us, I think, as, as Christians and as the church, of course, is that these people are going to actually need the love of Christ and the gospel long term, right? So how do you reach out to and minister to someone like an Ellen Page who's denied and marred the image of God in her and then turned around um, and, and hopefully someday comes to her senses? And you're already seeing this some in the trans movement. But yeah, the, the blindness... I mean, uh, scripture talks regularly about the eyes being blinded by sin um, and and the devil <laughs> and the world. And so, I mean, that's really what we're we're seeing is people uh, being blinded to the long term consequences of these short term decisions that they're making because you're popular today and then tomorrow <laughs> it's all over. Yeah, and it happens so, so quickly. Um, and that's the other thing, too, I think, again, that it's the they. We all, and, and this is not just Hollywood. We do it too, because everybody is, unfortunately sins and everybody is infected with sin. And we have our favorite ones and, and we can, you know, we can point across and say, look how evil Hollywood is. But, you know, we all are, we're all depraved. And, uh, but for the grace of God, but for the salvation of Christ, um, you know, we don't, we, we have no hope. 
Um, but it's we 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 defend such fleeting moments and we try to save these fleeting moments and we think that who we are is is you know well it really is an identity crisis isn't it whether it's whether it's Sharon Stone and saying you know basically saying I'm not young and I'm not a femme fatale anymore so they don't like me which is true that's absolutely true about Hollywood they probably don't because of that very reason or whether it's um, Ellen Page and, and and let me say something just quickly I don't know why I need to but I do. The reason we're, the re, well, at least, I don't know, I want to speak for you, uh, Nathaniel, but the reason I'm dead naming her is not because I want to disrespect her. In what we're up against today, spiritually in this culture, and that's another reason why I should say why um, why Lure is so important and Lure.tv, why that is so important, I think, as a um, as a new medium for entertainment. Because in part through entertainment, what we're, it's not like somebody just change their name and they want you to call them that, you know, like, you know, I had, I had different nicknames. You probably had some nicknames. Some of them were disparaging. People called me girls names all the time. That's because I'm, I'm not really a great athlete, but that wasn't because I'm a girl. I think I'm a girl. But when we talk about the thing like dead naming in this culture, what that is really saying is I want you to say this because I want you to affirm me and I want you to affirm my, um, my really my mental illness, my 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 delusion, my delusion, and yeah. and I can't do that, and that's not up to me. That's up to the Lord. You have to take that. I can't do that for you. I would if it were any other reason why you wanted me to call you Elliot. I would, but I can't for this reason. Uh, just in the same way as I wouldn't want you to affirm my, my delusions. Okay, so that's that's why I'm saying Ellen. Okay, and not Elliot. And um, whether or not you can get behind that is, is another thing, but uh, but we, we we defend such fleeting moments and and for for seemingly such a small reward, and it is it is sad it is tragic because here's the thing, these people are good at what they do they're among the best in the world at at their craft, and they won't move forward in it or they, or they seem to think that uh, I have to play this this woke blindness game in order to keep it up. And I think that's one of the things, and maybe you can speak just for a minute to Lore and Lore.tv and what Lore does, how Lore is gonna change some of that and how you see Lore changing that, specifically when it comes to movies, television, and uh, the filmed uh, video media. Yeah, I think um, the challenge for us um, as Christians, um, as conservatives in the world that we're in right now, is that the temptation is to, and I mean, we've just talked about these different issues with Sharon Stone and Elliot, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ellen Page. Um, and um, we've talked about, you know, a Fox News article and it's all, you know, the quick hits and everything else. But if we actually want to ch change um, the underlying story of the world, that um, enables these folks to be blind, um, that actually teaches them, that actually blinds them to what's going on, um, that supports that blindness, that spiritual blindness that's happening. Um, we have to tell better stories. Um, just punditry is not actually going to, um, to change this, to, to actually minister to someone like Ellen Page. There is a necessary story of the beauty and the glory of what a woman is that needs to be told that you can't just explain, um, you know, uh, didactically. It's not a it's not a, a well thought out. I mean, you can the, the, the philosophy is important. The theology of it is important. But ultimately, um, the beauty of uh, 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 a real woman who, um, you know, loves God, loves her husband, loves her children, um, builds a, a life that is glorifying to God and beautiful. And um, that, you know, thinking of the Proverbs 31 woman who um, her, her own works praise her in the gates. Um, until we, we start actually telling those stories, someone like Ellen Page is going to continue to think that her greatest good is going to come from denying uh, what God made her by marring the image of God in her and um, by running away from what she was made to be. Mm. Mm. And that's what Lure does. That's one of the things that uh, Lure offers is it, it is based 
faith entertainment, as we uh, as we call it, or, or I guess we're starting to coin that term now for lore. But um, and there's several right now. There's several contracts out. We just had uh, Jason Farley on a couple of episodes uh, prior to this one and talking about the different uh, films that are being that are being made. Some are in production, some are in pre-production, some are already made and are, and are, and are get finishing their funding. Um, there's already some uh, some features out already. Just real quickly before I move to the next topic, what are a couple of offerings on Lore right now that people can see if they go to Lore.tv and subscribe? What are a couple of um, offerings right now that you would recommend that you've enjoyed and uh, you think are telling some of those great stories? Um, so uh, one of the ones that I really appreciated that we actually funded during our beta, but you can still, I mean, you can stream it on the platform right now, uh, was Dark Holler, which is the, um, uh, it's basically a docudrama that is talking about the realities of um, uh, demonic activity of supernatural, of the supernatural in uh, Appalachia, specifically in this case. And that's a case where like we can have a deep theological discussion about, you know, demons and what they do and don't do, how active they are. You know, we can we can rail against the materialists that say there is no uh, supernatural or we can actually show the real stories of real people actually affected by su the supernatural um, and the the power of the gospel to actually deal in those people's lives. So we I really enjoyed that one. Um, I'm also really excited. I haven't actually watched the first episode yet, but. We funded the first episode um, now in the uh, in the um, app since we launched. And so the Wild Brothers, which are four uh, Christian brothers, um, Christian missionary brothers out in. Um, I forget where they're at. They're in beautiful islands, basically. And and their parents got them a camera about 10 years ago and they started making nature documentaries. And um, the first episode of that funded. So we're super excited about that. Yeah, I saw some of the uh, social media posts about that. And uh, Jason Farley, also another lore executive, very high on the Wild Brothers. I think that's one of those shows that can really strike a a chord in uh, in our audience and and uh, the audience beyond. So that's great. Uh, well, listen, we are going to uh, move on to our next segment here. And uh, coming up, our lore creator spotlight today featuring filmmaker Joel Burris. We'll talk to him uh, on the other side of the break. You are watching the lore or listening to, depending on your platform of choice, the Lore Entertainment Podcast. So it turns out the streamers are letting us all down. One has committed itself to destroying Grandma's terms of endearment for her grandbabies. Sorry, Grams. You can't call them cuties anymore. The other has decided that you can't have dragons unless you order them in a brown paper sleeve, so the mailman doesn't have to be wantonly subjected to the TNA of the Seven Kingdoms. You could go to the Christian streaming services where you can put on your ruby slippers and repeat to yourself over and over, but at least it's clean, but at least it's clean. Apparently, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, is also horribly executed. But does it have to be that way? Can a high standard for storytelling exist with a moral backbone and a complete set of clothes for every actor and actress? That is what Lure is about. Quality entertainment for people not interested in seeing strangers naked. Of course, if you are just looking for your fix of f and dragons, go to another streaming service, you perv. Be a part of the lore. Click the link below. And welcome back to the Lure Entertainment Podcast. It's time for now for our Lure Creator Spotlight. And today we welcome uh, filmmaker, writer, director, Joel Burris. Uh, he's got a new project called Black Rose Ballad. We're going to get into all of that. Joel, thank you for being part of the podcast. Man, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's truly an honor to be here with you guys and talk about what God's doing. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the project. We'll get into some of the uh, backstories and things here in a few minutes. But you've got a new project you're, you're um, doing with uh, Lure.tv, and it's called Black Rose Ballad. Uh, give us a little bit of the synopsis, what it's about, and uh, then we'll dig into to some of the details. Sure. Black Rose Ballad uh, is what I'm describing it as a period Western thriller. Uh, I say period because a lot of times people are like a Western. Oh, is it a neo Western? Like uh, you know Yellowstone. We're I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we are in the middle of a Western revival. I feel like we didn't have any really good westerns come out in the last five years or so. But um, recently, it seems like all Hollywood is wanting to make is westerns, and I guess that's because people want to see some good cowboy action. Uh, you know, 
shoot the Western kind of identified the uh, Hollywood uh, as it started coming on the scene. Um, as far as Black Rose Valley goes, it's a period Western thriller. Now, uh, one thing that you don't see a lot in uh, Christian marketing and filmmaking in general is thrillers, uh, just because it's it's a hard thing to market. But Black Rose Ballad, from its inception, has been something that I literally wanted to do just to be different. I started writing this in this picture itself back in 2015, and um, it sat and it sat. And every time I go to pick it up, it's like I just hit a brick wall. But I was like, I know I have something here, Lord. I don't even know where it's going. But I had page one written. And you said we'll get to backstory later. Uh, I digress. <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll jump into that later. But Black Rose Ballad, like I said, from the inception, has been something that I wanted to do different. Hmm. As a thriller, it's something that's going to leave uh, the audience with an uneasiness. And that's very intentional. I don't think that you could take the purpose and the theme of this movie and do it in a lighthearted manner and still get the same thing across black rose ballad it follows uh it follows a character and his mule uh right now we're calling him singing cowboy and i think that that's probably what's going to be um singing cowboy uh is a mule or is a mule has a mule and he is roaming around searching for destiny i feel like as a protagonist you have to you know they have to be relatable to an audience and I feel like a lot of people, especially uh, younger people, uh, it, well, I don't want to. I don't even want to say that. I feel like a lot of people in life, especially with the uneasiness of the times, they they feel aimless. They feel kind of wandering, uh, searching around for destiny, and especially uh, if you don't know that you're doing exactly what God's calling you to do. So, Black Rose Bell follows uh, Singing Cowboy as he searches for his destiny. He roams from town to town, and. He, as he's going from town to town, he's interweaving uh, with towns that are in disarray because the, seemingly uh, the best people of the town uh, are, are being murdered by uh, a mystic outlaw. He has a, a legend behind him. People say that he's a phantom. He's a ghost. He's not real. But then people have seen him. So, um, And that character is the main antagonist, and that is Black Hat. Um, Black Hat is really uh, somebody that we follow extensively through this. Um, and as he interacts with the different characters, I'm trying not to give away too much. Uh, but basically, um, basically, the, each of the characters he interacts with on the outside is seemingly a, a superb person, uh, upstanding in nature, uh, above reproach. But uh, for some reason, he's only targeting those good people. Uh, hmm. If you were a bad person uh, by everybody else's standards, you know, he's just going to let whatever's coming to you come to you. But um, I think that as we go through with Black Rose Ballad, as the viewer uh, watches, they're going to relate to several characters in this. And it's by design. And each one is going to touch on a, a different hot and button topic of today. Um, we're, I mean, we're tackling some heavy stuff. So we can get into that. Um, but at its, at its core, Black Rose Ballad is a Western uh, as a method of making you feel a certain way. Um, we're going to lean more into the thriller side of things. And it's set definitely in the Old West, in the mountains, in the prairies, and in the uh, dry, dusty, arid climates as well. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, Joel, how did you get into filmmaking and storytelling? So as, to be honest, I, ha I kind of came in uh, out of necessity. My uh, church that I was going to as a teenager, I mean, as a teenager, I mean, I was like 12, 13. They didn't have anybody doing anything. And I was taking a, a class and I was like, you know, this seems kind of cool my, up my alley. And they had just tools laying around. So I picked them up. Uh, my youth pastor at the time encouraged me. Uh, he's like, man, you've got some talent in this area. So why don't you just kind of go for it and see what you can do? And uh, then we started making little short little sketches and funny comedy stuff. Um, 
my as far, as far as my work with within the church goes, uh, most of it's comedy. Uh, but uh, me as a filmmaker doing my own thing, um, I definitely lean more towards the darker side of things. Uh, to me, that's just where it is. So everything that I've done uh, up to this point uh, has been of a more lighthearted nature whenever it's with a church. But um, a lot of my filmmaking has been uh, with different churches. We've done um, Easter productions that are uh, half story told on stage through play. And then those same characters uh, interact and do things that you can't do on a stage uh, in film. And so uh, we've done big productions like that uh, involving plane crashes, uh, involving, uh, you know, emergency situations where somebody's racing down, you know, uh, the highway and an ambulance, uh, wow. getting carried into the hospital. So lots of, lots of big, bigger production value type scenes that you can't do on a stage, you know, we've been able to pull off and, uh, that's definitely, you know, God's orchestrated those things. And it's funny throughout my entire career as uh, a storyteller, uh, everything, if you give something to God, he's going to run with it. I mean, if, if you're operating in his will and you say, God, use me however you want to use me, he's going to take that and he's going to literally um, open up doors that you can't even imagine. And honestly, that's kind of why I feel like I'm sitting here today. Um, through all the church time uh, film productions, uh, I made a lot of really great looking stuff. Um, the last five years or so, uh, five or six years, I have done a heavy amount of visual production work in the music industry. Uh, I do a lot of uh, Christian rock metal um, type music videos. And each one of those stories, um, people have recognized me for, uh, and this is just, you know, I point back to God on it. But uh, when people come to me, they're not necessarily looking for the craziest performance flashiness uh they're looking to tell a story uh behind the song it's a deep meaning i've done ones from uh any you know from anything ranging from somebody with uh suicidal thoughts uh to a supernatural uh you know stepping from this world into a supernatural world uh i've done ones uh dealing with human trafficking sex trafficking and uh you know in that in that music video, we actually were uh, showing uh, somebody's story that was very close and dear to me that um, she was trafficked and mm -hmm. by somebody in her family and then stunned by her family. So uh, lots of heavy topics. And that's really where I found my groove uh, because as wonderful as life is, um, I feel like uh, a lot of the high times are defined by the low times. And one of the things in talking with people I feel uh, have been missing in certain areas of Christian, you know, television and media. And, you know, I'm not throwing shade on anybody at all. These are just conversations that I've that I've had is they are searching for something that feels more real in the sense of they can identify with it. Like, um, they can identify with, you know, human sex trafficking and things like that. And there are movies out there that, that you know, are Christian productions that are phenomenal in that area. But they, um, there's just an extra sense of grit and, and realism factor uh, that I try to throw into these things, into, uh, into my, my productions, into the, the stories that I tell. And that's something that, I carried from the church days. Uh, and I still do that, you know, um, but also through to the music video days. And ultimately, um, God led me to the time now to do it in uh, first feature film. So I'm very excited about it. Uh, I've had you know, over a decade's worth of experience telling stories in different manners for different audiences. And now I feel like God's kind of blending them all together. Now, on Black Rose Ballad, you have uh, quite a bit of location shooting uh, Montana, mm -hmm. Texas, Missouri, uh, maybe Colorado. Yeah. Talk about yeah. how you, uh, why you chose some of those locations and what you're hoping to do in Colorado. 
So this to me, <laughs> what I'm hoping to do in Colorado, uh, <laughs> I'm hoping to shoot part of a, a movie there. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, that's that's the goal here. You know, uh, we with Black Rose Ballad, I'm trying to um, without taking away from the quality of the story. I'm trying to show as much diversity uh, as possible. And I'm doing that through multiple formats, multiple mediums. I'm doing that through the, um, uh, through the subplots, through the different characters, what each character is struggling with. Um, and in this particular instance with the locations, uh, there have been great Westerns. And a lot of times people think of Westerns as, you know, High Plains Drifter or, um, you know, any Western that happens out in Arizona and New Mexico, out in the, the buttes and the dusty sand and the, the dirt and the tumbleweeds and cactus. You know, that's what people think of as a Western. But then you, there's also something completely different, you know, like within Pale Rider and The Hateful Eight, um, most recently with Quentin's movie. It, um, the, they're also in the mountains and visually, uh, as a storyteller, you can do so much with different locations like that. There's, you know, mountains can offer a sense of protection uh, from something. Uh, they can also uh, offer a sense of overbearing, you know, if you're in that mind state of like, oh, I have to climb to the top of this thing. So as a storyteller, as a filmmaker there and as a director, there are so many different ways that you can use different locations to tell a story. And so within each one of these situations in the sub stories uh, and the, the couple of different towns that we go to, um, we are experimenting with using the location Excel itself, uh, showing how that put, you know, plays in with uh, Montana. I've actually uh, I've actually been in touch and uh, been I'm trying to be delicate here with how much I can say because. I don't want to speak out of turn, but basically we've uh, we've locked down a a ghost town uh, up there that somebody has turned into an Airbnb. So uh, we've act, you know we've got a great deal on it. Uh, so as soon as we hurry up and fund through war, my gold dude, everybody, um, <laughs> uh, we'll be able to uh, finalize and secure all that. Uh, but. Basically, uh, there is a ghost town up there. Somebody's turned it into an Airbnb. So cast, crew, and all that are going to be able to stay on set. Uh -huh. But Missouri is where I'm from, and we have some scenes that – let's get real for a second. Um, uh, this is – you know, this is – what we're aiming for is a lower-budget film. Uh, this is definitely not a, you know, $100 million film with Hollywood – but I'm aiming for much, much higher production value than what you would expect or anticipate. And that's one of the benefits I see as being a writer director is as I'm writing this, knowing that I'm going to be one to direct it, I'm able to write scenes that could take place any place, anywhere. And so in Missouri, there are some locations, there are some relationships that I've built. Um, and that is so key because I feel like God orchestrates things throughout your entire life. And then he's like, Oh, Hey, guess what? Uh, this one little nugget that, uh, you know, I planted six years ago, I'm going to pull that out and, uh, you're going to be able to use it now. And you'll just see that, you know, I'm God. I see everything. I orchestrate everything. So whenever you're about ready to make a movie about a, a murderer, the outlaw that goes around killing a bunch of people and you need a church to shoot at, um, guess what? <laughs> I've got a connection for you. Um, turn. We're building a legacy here uh, where people will be able to come on in generations and watch the stuff that we have provided, that we've built whenever nobody said that we could. And so right now, I want to encourage everybody. One second. This is going to be a good, a good liner for you, and I need to freshen up on the water. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that your throat is not parched, because I know that whatever you're about to say is earth 
shattering, especially if it has to do with lore.tv, right? <laughs> yeah. One of the biggest things about lore for me is taking – let me back up. One of the biggest things about lore that people say is it's difficult – to start something like this with little content on the platform. And you're hundred percent right. But I want to encourage people with this. People that are signing on to lore right now as filmmakers know just how difficult something like this is to get off the ground. And with black Rose ballad in particular, I've been working on this since 2015. This is my baby. This is something that I have literally lost sleep over sweat, blood, tears, everything. I mean, I've walked through some very dark times in writing this. And I'm not just going to partner with somebody um, just because, you know, it has to be God ordained. And with this, with lore, the thing that attracts me the most about it is doing something beneficial. So even if this movie never, ever funds, people don't want to see it. We are doing something that people will be able to see the value in even in just subscribing. So people don't want to watch, you know, uh, people want to watch, you know, whatever they want to watch whenever they subscribe to someplace. But with lore, it's different because we're building something from the ground up and we're doing something that's going to change lives. And in so doing, I'm trying to pull that in with uh, the creative process, like partnering with this church, um, guess what? You know, we're going to shoot this movie. We're going to make it happen. And there are going to be elements that help people out um, in the communities that we live in, in doing this. So it's not just donating money to a platform so you, you know, can fund a movie. It's also doing some bigger, bigger things uh, and allowing the gospel to reach places, um, not just through watching the movie. So there are, there are so many different areas that I see God's hand at work through lore and through this production itself, even though we're, you know, we haven't started shooting or anything like that. I've been doing a lot of pre-production work and it, uh, it's already showing just how God is going to bring everything together and orchestrate it. I'm so excited about it. I really am. And Lore is the one place that I feel like I can really band together with other like-minded Christians and believers, tell some stories that wouldn't get told anywhere else, uh, and show God's love and mercy to people through direct onset communications, talking about it. And it's only uh, because of you know people subscribing, people buying into the platform not just uh, whenever it's got a thousand titles on it that you can just scroll through and pick whatever you want to watch. Um, but now, uh, now in the early days, building something, being pioneers, what better way to just take God's love and um, vengeance in some cases, uh, wink, wink, hint, hint, and take it and drive it out West, uh, you know, drive it out West. Now, Joel, and, you were. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish it up. Well, I just uh, taking God's love to the uninhabited areas. Whenever westerns, you know, every period Western piece is in that they are in the the settings where you can ride for six days and not see anybody, not come across anybody, and in today's climate, in today's world, you can go six days without seeing somebody and thinking, oh, that person's a believer. That's a fellow believer. So now more than ever, I feel like people that subscribe, filmmakers, uh, people that love movies, uh, people that just want to do something uh, beneficial for the kingdom of God, whether you want to log in and watch TV or movies or anything like that, the more that people buy into this specific platform, the way that things are being done, um, the more that we are able to take, you know, God's gospel of love and mercy and head out on the Oregon trail and 
make a killer movie and do some spreading of the gospel while we're at it. There are damnable men in this world. Yes, there is no escaping the evil, the violence, or whatever hell is in you that leaves men to hang in the balance of eternity. So if you have the courage, oh, you'll go Your ear, I will tell you the tale. Are you in the blood of, the of the Black Rose Ballad. Uh, Joe, I've got a couple more questions for you here, but I want to break and get Nathaniel's thoughts because Nathaniel Talbot, as you know, is one of the uh, one of the lower ground floor, um, you know, founders. And you were speaking to the uh, you're speaking to the vision that Lure has. This is going to be here, hopefully, after us. We're talking about legacy, legacy storytelling, biblical legacy storytelling, and and Nathaniel, um, in your mm-hmm. perspective, and from what from what you've seen in building this platform um does does joel's description of the vision of lore um, uh, line up uh with uh with what you are working toward as a part of the that you know the core team yeah absolutely i think one of the really um interesting things there in what you're laying out joel as far as the vision goes is um uh, we haven't founded lore as a christian nonprofit, right we founded Lore as a for-profit corporation. Why is that? Well, because we believe that this is about uh, loving our neighbors. And uh, one of the things we do is we we exchange things. And so absolutely investing into the local communities um, and and getting involved with those and building up this this legacy. I mean, um, we need uh, we want we want the content on Lore to last for our great grandkids um, that it takes some money to keep the servers on and everything else. Right. So mm-hmm. um, we're, we're going out and building and we really hope that folks will get involved. I, I am so excited about this, Joel, honestly, because <laughs> um, Christian in Christian film and Christian circles, you know, we, I love the Psalms and we, we all love the Psalms that are all, you know, rejoicing and glad and happy and everything else, but there's some darker notes in the Psalms. Yeah. Um, you move on to something like Ecclesiastes. I mean, uh, between I, I can't decide which is the more Western book, Ecclesiastes or Judges. Like one of those two <laughs> is definitely the most Western book in in the Bible. And we don't have enough stories being told in those yeah. notes in, you know, at that register. Right. Um, right. And so I am super psyched to uh, I'm so excited uh, back about Black Rose Ballad. I I mean, it's one of our, our bigger stretches. You know, we've got a couple of feature films, Wave 1. It's a little bit more of a stretch, but it's already uh, collecting some uh, some loot. And we are super excited um, to see it uh, fun. And I want to see more Westerns after this, you know. I mean, oh, yeah. I want to see, uh, you know, it, I've loved some of the different Westerns. I mean, 310 to Yuma always sticks in my mm. in my head. And, oh, yeah. Um, but the the redemption arcs, the uh, the colorful characters, the le- like you said, leaving people uneasy. I mean, it, Christian films don't leave people uneasy. You have to resolve no. everything by the end of the film, and everybody has to go away happy. And um, yeah. uh, but you know, reading Judges leaves me uneasy. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, it's I'm just super psyched about the Western motif. Oh, I, uh... Thank you so much. I, with Westerns, I, so I go back and forth on Westerns because I can see both Western as the, I think a lot of times we, well, pop culture, I think, sees Western as the setting, like you were talking about the tumbleweeds and the, the dirt roads and the old, you know, town centers and all that kind of thing. But there's also, there's a genre of storytelling uh, in the Western genre that, that is, that can be in a lot of things. Like, I think that Star Wars is a Western, for example. Mm-hmm. I just think it takes place yeah. in space. Um, you know, but of course my favorite Western is back to the future part three, but I'll leave that aside. <laughs> um, 
uh, Joel, of course. I, 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 here's a bonus question for you. What advantage do you think that telling this story of Black Rose Ballad in the Western genre gives you as opposed to, you know, in a in a standard thriller genre or a modern day uh, type of telling? How does how does telling it as a Western help get across the story um, and the and the messages, the meaning that you want to express? Well, thank you so much for that question, because it really is. It, it really is a, a great one. Because whenever I set out to write this, I wanted to do a Western because, like I said, 2015, nobody was doing Westerns. But since then, I've seen God's hand bring it back in. And in doing so, I had uh, some, I had sent a copy of the screenplay once I got a copy written to uh, a friend of mine. And she told me, and I didn't realize it until she said it, but she's like, I'm glad that you're doing this as a Western. And I was like, why, what do you mean? And she's like, the, some of the things that you tackle, some of the principles, some of the um, different sides of these taboo subjects um, are extremely volatile right now. They're, they're very uneasy in modern culture. And to tell the story with the end result that you want, I feel like it was such a great um, move on your part to write this as a Western because you can get by with showing things in an old Western setting and people will automatically relate it to their current knowledge of such and without going out and just making something that is directly blatantly, you know, anti this or pro that. And Whenever she said that, I was like, oh, my gosh, the Lord just started dumping into me because I was like, with with using the, the Western genre, I'm really able to do that. And I saw his hand uh, in retrospect guiding me in every single direction that I went because I struggled. Like I said, I we're, we're only in the pre-production phase of, of this thing. So in the development, writing the screenplay. In those times, I I was bleeding quite literally about this um, in different areas. And I felt it every single time I did this because I was like, Lord, I'm trying to use this to present the gospel message to people that right now want to just scream at each other because, well, this person is, you know, supports abortion and this person is, you know, an abolitionist for abortion. And it's like, yeah, you know, and it's like, there has to be a way to make this side understand where this side is coming from and this side understand where this side is coming from. And then together, when they both have that understanding, say, hey, what is the thing that is very deep inside of you? And it's that passion that I feel like God instilled in us as human beings to be passionate about something. Sometimes culture can warp our perspectives one way or another. But in this Western setting, people can relate. And one of the best things about Westerns is there is a sense of justice. There's a sense of morality. There's a sense that the good guy always wins out in the end. And the cavalry comes over the hill and here we are, uh, bang, 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 all the bad guys die and all the good guys go home and, uh, you know, have dinner with their family. Um, and in the Western genre, I can take some of those elements that people are okay with. Um, they're okay with violence. They're okay with, you know, shooting and they're okay with you know in some elements gore but they're not okay with it uh in a more modern setting like i'm not going to go into some subplots here but i'll i'll dance <clears throat> briefly briefly over some of the topics that we cover in this movie relatable topics uh there's what i feel like one of the big ones right now uh is uh, racism, uh, abortion, um, crooked law enforcement, 
um, prosperity gospel. We're talking about uh, different things that are so um, hot button topics. I mean, people are already getting uneasy because I said, you know, crooked law enforcement and abortion. And I'm like, okay, well, we're uneasy about the topics because we are passionate about them on one side or the other. But how do I take that passion that is riled up on both sides uh, or that uneasiness that's riled up on both sides? And how do I say, hey, guess what? Here's how the gospel message fits into that. I was going to say, I'm using, I was going to say what you do is you say, okay, you get your six shooter, I get mine. We'll meet you at high noon and draw. Like that's yep. that. I wasn't, I didn't quite, I, but I realized the gospel is better. The gospel is better. Well, but, you know, also the, draw. The, oh, yeah. I mean, there's <laughs> definitely, let's just, you bring that up. Well, that's a Western trope. And like, <clears throat> you can't have a Western without some tropes. <laughs> but uh, this is true. I, I literally, um, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, in the midst of a Western revival uh, of sorts for the genre, I want to do the community as a whole. I want to do Christian filmmaking as a whole. Um, I want to do it a good service. I want to. I want to make the best thing that I can make. And if somebody's tuning in expecting to watch a Western, uh, I want to give them a Western. Yeah. If somebody's tuning in and wants to have a, a twist uh, heading into the third act, they're going to get one, uh, whether they like it or not. And that leading into the third act I, was probably the most um, soul searching uh, that I'd done because I was like, okay, everything's just flowing, flowing, flowing. I think it's great. Third act, boom. Oh God, how do I want to, how do I want to end this thing? And I feel like as storytellers, most of the time people start and like, Hey, how do I get to this point? Um, right. And then they kind of work backwards. Me, I'm just like, Lord, um, I've written stuff in the past, but I've never taken it as serious as I have on this particular project. Uh, I mean, we're talking about, you know, church comedy sketches. We're not talking about uh, basically trying to bring peace and unity between people and using the gospel message to tell it. And to the meanwhile, we're shooting and killing people. You know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, it sounds like but, you, you talk about some of the some of the tropes and things and, and you know, um, you're wanting to, you know, people are going to come to a Western and expect a certain thing. So you have the, the weight of expectations, but you also have the story that you want to tell in different elements. It's kind of like. You know, if, um, you know, if I went to see, uh, I'm going to date myself, whatever. You know, if I go to see, you know, Paul McCartney and he doesn't play Hey Jude, I'd be like, dude, where, what happened here? <laughs> um, you know, I'd, I'd want a refund in full <clears throat> and probably a counseling session. But uh, same, is, same is true with some of those tropes. We go to see Western, we want to see that. But we are there for some of the new stuff and some of the deep cuts mm -hmm. and some of the... Uh, some oh. of the deeper themes as well, if you will. <laughs> I want to uh, yeah. I want to ask uh, this question. There are uh, a few things. We've got a few minutes left here. We um, there are a few things that that you've noted influenced some of the story and some of your writing. Um, you know, the Lord took you on a journey to learn humility, coming out of pride, and and uh, and your your mother's passing was a part of part of part of that and shaping and and coming coming out uh, breaking the cycle of addiction, things like that. Um, share a little bit of your journey and some of those things that have influenced you uh, relationally, experientially, and how those um, shape uh, the story that you're telling. Yeah, so I noted earlier in the episode that. Um, Black Hat, the main antagonist of this movie. Um, is there more than one? Uh, Black Hat is going after seemingly only the perfect people, the people that um, have everything together. But we all know that there's such thing as a sin nature, and there is no such thing as a perfect person. And I'm sorry, this is it's, it's very difficult for me to talk about even still. Um, 
God did has done so much work in my personal life. Um, and it's very difficult for me to even come on uh, something like this and talk about my project because I don't want it to be, you know, all about me or anything like that. Cause there's some incredible people involved, um, that are already signed on to the project, um, and more to come. But there is a fine line that I've had to, to tow between, uh, this being my project as writer director conveying the story, my vision for this. Um, but whenever I got to the third act where everything really ties together, um, I struggled with it so incredibly hard. Um, because I was like, Lord, how, how do I wrap this thing up? How do I take all these things that are happening, all this violence and all these emotions that I've stirred up in the, in the audience, how do I take that and turn it back to you without it being, um, you know, detrimental to the project in a sense of, you know, like, I don't want people to get there and be like, Oh, I hated that ending. You know, um, I want them to be surprised. Uh, and I'm also making this for non-believers too. There's a lot of this movie that like people will watch and it will, it'll surprise, it'll surprise the believers, um, in a good way. And like I said, I want to do this all responsibly because I know that this is the way the Lord's been leading me and has opened doors up every single time I try and, uh, do something. The, the pride that I had was one that is sneaky and, um, we don't necessarily realize that it's there until somebody takes the time and makes us uncomfortable and points it out. And that to me, uh, it took the one, one of the most single handed, uh, one of the people that was single handedly, uh, shaped me as a teenager growing up, a person that I looked up to immensely, uh, as a teenager through music. Um, and the Lord took me into the, um, music industry and, uh, in, you know, filmmaking and stuff like that and allowed me to meet this person face to face and we've become good friends. And so that's one of the things that like people say, don't ever meet your idols. Cause they'll, you know, you know, let you <laughs> down every time. Um, that wasn't the case with me on this one. And I see them, you know, for who they are as a, as a real person, but they took the time to invest in me. Um, and I won't, I, I haven't, you know, cleared with them to make a, you know, make anything more public than that, but they took the time to invest in me and called me out and I'm like, man, you've got something going on here and you need to deal with it. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, no, that's not me. And I listed a hundred reasons why it wasn't me. And that friendship got real rocky, but he stayed there throughout the whole thing. And about a month later, um, this was all shortly after my mom passed away. So I was already, you know, an emotional wreck. Um, about a month later, um, I call him up about a project that we're doing. And I was like, Hey, um, by the way, you don't, you, you don't still think that way towards me, do you? And he's like, are you still on that? And I was, I was like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, man, that's, I still think that. And I know I'm being vague, but uh, I want to. Long story short, um, I made I made some poor choices. I made some uh, poor jokes, and they came from a sense of uh, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. I you know I don't mean any you know harm in it or anything like that, and. Uh, I use the words as like, uh, my character means more to me than that. That's not me. Why would you think that about me? I'm not like that. And he's like, ah, gotcha. And he's like, Joel, he, he, he told me, he's like, Joel, your character doesn't mean anything. And I was like, what? 
And he's like, you're coming that as your character. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's something to strive for and, and attain, uh, you know, or hope to attain. But where you're coming from on this, this is, uh, this is a sin nature type thing. And this is something that you're, you're living in a situation of pride over. And I was like, it broke me, man. Cause I was like, he's a, he's a hundred percent right. Like, um, in the long run, you want to be a good person. You, I mean, even in the short run, you want to be a good person. Who doesn't want to be a good person? Um, and with, with everything that was going on, uh, in my life, losing my mom, she was supposed to help me write. She was an author herself and, uh, she was going to help me on a couple of things in there. And she was really excited that I was going to do it. Then she got sick, uh, with COVID went in the hospital and uh, never came back out. Um, hmm. And so I was dealing with all that and I had that mindset and I feel like God used this friend of mine in the music industry. I mean, I can probably mention their name and at least half the audience would recognize them immediately. Um, I came into that and the Lord just really used it to show me multiple areas in my life that were full of pride that was being masked under uh, a sense of humility that I felt like I had. And I mean, we can go, we can go deeper than that if you want, but the, the whole issue that we as humans face, in this walk um, with Christ is ever striving uh, to be Christ-like. It's, you know, that process of, um, you know, trying to be better, trying to be made more uh, or to be, you know, more representative of Christ. And I realized that until I had this break, and I just started. I just. I just started bleeping on the phone with this person, and I was just like, "Man, I'm. I'm sorry. You know, um, please forgive me. Like, please, please, please forgive me." And it wasn't even like, you know, uh, any grand scheme of things. It wasn't a big deal of what I did. Um, but to this person, it was, and I think God used him. Uh, as somebody that influenced me as a teenager growing up, um, use the current relationship uh, as working companions and friends um, to to bring correction to me. And he did it in private. He did it in a biblical manner. And man, it rocked my world. But let me tell you something. I mean, I was going through that for a solid month straight. It was probably one of the darkest periods of my life. And as soon as I had this revelation uh, and realization, I should say, of everything that was going on internally, um, I had my answer. I had my direction on where I wanted to go in the third act. And from there, it just uh, it flew. And so with with this project, Black Rose Ballads, in particular, there's not one word that was written on this on these pages flippantly, uh, not uh, without me thinking about it, rethinking about it. Uh, decisions made. There's elements in this movie that um, literally made me uncomfortable uh, writing it as a Christian knowing, uh, the weight, like, as like, there are going to be some people that will be so closed off to this message because of one little thing. It's not a sin, but it's one little thing that people get wrapped up in. And, you know, uh, it's too taboo to be in a Christian movie. Um, but I'll tell you that some of the things that, uh, 
my conversations with non-believers about this movie, um, they're so hyped for. Uh, and they don't even realize that it's something that I'm using to, to bring the gospel message in. And I mean, I, I think that's such a great thing about this project, Joel. Um, the fact that you're, you're really focused on telling, uh, like making a good movie, like you're focused on making a good Western and yeah, it's got twists and turns, but all truth is God's truth. Like, um, if, if you're going to tell these stories, well, which I think you're so you're so zeroed in on that. It's 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 really interesting too, just to hear you talking about the the challenge you had with with hypocrisy and other things, and then you go, you're making a movie about masked men, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's 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 so obviously all tied together. Um, and I, and but I was blind to it, man. I was blind right? to it. But I had already written all the things leading up to that point. I was like, this is cool. I like this. I like this. This yeah. was like so inspired and I was doing it uh, like knowing that what I was writing at, don't get me wrong. I wasn't just writing something and then it just like, Oh no, I knew what I was writing and I knew my, my, my thought of where it would go, but it, in diving down deep into the Western genre, what you're going to see going into the third act to my knowledge has never been portrayed in a Western film before. And in, in doing that, I struggled. I was like, because God, I don't, <clears throat> and this is like, this is how I, I have to try and communicate because if, if I don't, then I kind of lean back into this like whole pride mindset, which I'm very, I, I don't want to do anymore. Uh, so I have to be kind of deliberate about it. I was like, God, I don't want to just do something just because it's like, Oh, you know, um, it hasn't been done before to my knowledge, you know, cause then as soon as I do that, somebody else would be like, Oh yeah, they did it in five other movies. I can name off the top of my head, uh, that I haven't seen. But, right. uh, I was like, the biggest thing was I didn't want to take somebody out of the movie at that point with the twist. And be like, Oh no, no, you just ruined it for me. And then them not actually catch the full, uh, driving message and hook back in. So yeah, I'm, I am coming at this from a very, um, uh, I just want to make a great movie, but to me, all great movies make you think. Uh, oh yeah, and all great memorable stories are so stinking relatable. Um, and I've got a lot of influences on it. There, are, I mean, the, the way that music is brought into this uh, into this movie. Uh, it's not a musical, so people that hate musicals don't tune out here. It's not <laughs> it's a not musical. Seven Brides for Seven Brothers? <laughs> <laughs> it's not. But, I mean, it's not a bad movie. Uh, um, there are so many. Um, I would liken it to uh, Oh Brother, Who Art Thou? Oh Brother, okay. Who Art Thou is not a musical, yep. but there are moments where song is used in there. And what do you remember most about Oh Brother, Who Art Thou? No, I'm Probably a man of constant in. sorrow. There's one. And then the other one is those sirens singing, at, you know, in the river. Down to the river. And it's yep. like, yeah. So it's like music is being very much used in the same way in this movie. And so I, I am so excited to take all these little things, bring them in together. I mean, I've got, if it, if we didn't live in a, in a, a digital age where I can have a note board uh, on a, you know, a digital you know, computer file and spread it all out. I would look like a madman person with pictures and, you know, strings <laughs> all over the wall. And this like and a conspiracy this. theory guy. Yes, like exactly. <laughs> oh, I would be that way. Like to it, to a hunch. It just blows my mind. Just how much stuff, whenever I look back, because I, like I said, I've been working on this since 2015. There was a right. couple of times where it, it got like, I, I put it down for a while, right. but I've been actively working and writing on this thing since 2019. And the relationships that I have now that have like, if I was to make this movie back in 2015, uh, I wouldn't have, uh, I would not have the connections that I have now. I would not, I mean, I mean, lower a little, uh, but I've got right. uh, a two time uh, Emmy winning uh, composer that signed on to the project that is more excited about the project than I am. Um, <clears throat> and so we have people that 
you know, lore is great because they're bringing in people that are, their work is widely recognized by the world uh, in, you know, animators and, you know, things like that. But I'm, I'm excited because I'm bringing in people uh, that are recognized by Hollywood as being, you know, hey, you're winning an Emmy for your musical compositions. Uh, they don't just hand those out to anybody. And to be able to have somebody like that that is so passionate about it, so passionate about being able to use his God-given talents in a fresh way for a project like this, uh, it just means the world to me. And the music, the score is something that is so, so important. Um, in this project and in the Western film uh, genre as well, because like you can tell, you can take all the music away, swap it out with music from another movie, and you might have a different genre of movie yeah, uh, right. based on the music alone. And yeah. so tying all these things in together, like I'm almost super excited to talk about it after people have seen it. So I'm like, all right, we're going to have to do a right. spoiler episode. I mean, you uh, are because- clearly going... <laughs> I can't wait for the Joel Burris, like, uh, you know, where you watch the movie and you give commentary on it as, as we, yeah, we, oh, yeah. we need like, to do, this sounds, this sounds like one of the movies that maybe, and maybe, I don't know, maybe we can talk about it at lore, but when it debuts, like we need to host a watch party with, um, with oh, yeah. Joel Burris and, uh, yeah. you know, and go, going over the whole thing because it seems like there's so much in there. And I will say this, uh, you were talking about, um, you know, blindness and blindness to sin in your own life and how that uh particularly shaped the third act and, and you know it's interesting god tells these stories the the topic we were talking about in the first segment of this podcast was blindness and the blindness that's in hollywood and woke blindness and how people can't see uh you know that sometimes we contribute to our own demise and yet we we defend and we we protect the thing that's killing us or the thing that's hurting us and, and what have you and so god's even writing that kind of story right here right now in fact this may be this may be, Joel, the first Western genre podcast ever. We are in a Western right now. Um, right now. Which would make me Dolomite, but that's okay. All right. So. Uh, oh, man. Uh, anyway, um, we do have to run. There's so much more. Joel, I hope you'll come back because I know there's a lot more uh, that uh, there is that we can talk more. about. And we, we have, a, but uh, you brought so much uh, to the program today. Thank you. Uh, Nathaniel Talbot, thank you for being on the program. Want to make sure, you, Nathaniel, anything else you want to add or, or ask Joel before we go? No. I mean, the main thing that I would say is that fans of Westerns need to tell all their friends about Lore.TV and the amazing Western that's currently funding there. Yeah, and here's the way to do it. Go to Lore.TV, subscribe, become a member at Lore. Uh, you will get loot. Those are our credits. But, but effectively, your subscription dollars go to the production of the films and shows that you want to see. So uh, check out Black Rose Ballad. Uh, you can find that. We, we're going to play a trailer here uh, when we go to break, so you'll be able to see a little a sneak peek of Black Rose Ballad and and uh, and Joel's work. But Joel, thank you again. Uh, lastly, where thank can you. people where can people People find you if uh, if they want to follow up with you, ask you questions, or see more of your more of your work. Maybe a couple of websites, social media. Where are you at? Where are you at? Oh my gosh, that's horrible grammar. Oh. Uh, never mind. Where are you at? Well, where you, you can at? come find me. Uh, <laughs> you can come find me on the interweb. Uh, <laughs> so I'm on all social media. Uh, pretty much at I'm Joel Burris. Uh, we'll get you anywhere where I'm at: Facebook, uh, Instagram. My Twitter is currently in Twitter jail. I think somebody stole it, and I'm going back and forth on it. Uh, so Elon Musk, if you're watching this, forget about fixing my uh, Twitter account and just please buy some gold loot so we can make this movie. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but uh, my website's IamJoelBurris.com and ExemplarFilms.com. Uh, so lots of cool stuff. Uh, thank you guys so much for the, the opportunity to be on here and talk about it. I know I rambled a little bit, but... Uh, Hopefully you hear my heart, my passion behind why I want to do this. And uh, I want to thank Lore and all the guys there for trusting. And um, yeah, let's go make a killer Western day. 